All right, hello and welcome to this webinar training. We're doing, uh, a couple weeks ago, we did our first ever four day design sprint with Experimenter Studios. That's Sebastian and Georgian from Experimenter Studios. I'm Chris and Kathy from Lifter LMS. And Julie came with us as an example going through the process. So it was super cool. I learned a ton and I know the audience did as well. If you are here on this webinar and you were uh, present for some of the four day design sprint process, let us know in the chat which was what was most, um, what your biggest takeaway was, what you learned that's gonna help you in your course creation process. And also um, this is gonna be Q and A um, intensive at the end. So. We're really lucky to have Sebastian and Georgian here with us and they're with their instru instructional design yeah. skills. Um, so bring your questions. There's a Q&A box here in Zoom. There's also the chat. We're gonna save questions till the end, but go ahead if you have um, questions as we're presenting, don't be shy, just drop them in there. That way when we get to the Q&A part at the end, um, I can kind of manage the time and MC what we have for questions and we can dig in but uh yeah that's that's really it i'm i'm just super stoked that was a lot of fun i love the idea of how we um like i didn't even think it was possible to do what we did in four days but i think sebastian and your process to, to like condense it down to like do a sprint and get that much done and that much assumptions on the table creative thinking actual testing, prototyping, doing all that in four days is like, yeah. Kind and of we started from zero pretty much, <laughs> from knowing pretty much nothing about uh, Julie's business. So yes, it was uh, quite, a, quite a team achievement. And we also learn a lot from uh, our audience, uh, from their questions and, uh, but we'll discuss about that uh, a little bit uh, later because it was an, a learning opportunity for us as well. So yeah. it's not only teaching us sharing knowledge and experiences with the audience, but it's the other way around as well. We are learning from, from, from them. We are learning about their problems. We are learning about the way they want to, to be helped in this uh, course creation endeavor. So yeah, it was uh, quite an amazing experience. And as a matter of fact, I think I am lucky to, to have the, the opportunity to share all these things with uh, with you, with your team, and uh, with Lifter LMS community. Awesome. Well, let's get into it. Um, so we're going to do a recap of the four-day course design sprint challenge. And I'm also just listening to you, the audience, of your interest in doing something like this again, uh, doing challenge uh, this type of challenge. Um, yeah, this is like, I really think a challenge can help focus people because there's a lot stacked up against course creators. It's a lot to do. There's a lot to figure out and to get this focused, I think is super helpful. So I'm just, let's see how, let's see how this goes and uh, what questions we have and um, let us know. I, I can't wait till we get to the end and we get into the questions and see what people are asking. So what did we learn, Sebastian? Tell us what we did and what we can take away and what you found. Well, actually, we learned a lot in, in those four days. Uh, please let me share my screen. Just give me a second. You should be able to, to see my screen now. Got it. Okay. So the first part of my presentation today is just a quick recap of the workshop. I'm not going to uh, get into the same level of details, obviously, because it's not going to be a repeat of uh, everything we, we, we've done. But just a quick recap, uh, highlighting mostly on, uh, on the outcomes for each of the steps that we've been uh, doing in the four days. After that, uh, I want to take this opportunity to, to share my thoughts as a sprint uh, a facilitator with you, my key learnings, and uh, open the, the floor for discussion as a, as a group, of course, with, uh, with all the team members as well. So that's the, the meaning plan for today. Without further ado, uh, let's recap the objective, which was to validate a course idea. 
by creating a prototype and testing it with real learners. So the purpose or the objective of this event, of this workshop, wasn't to develop a full course, but just to test a course idea through prototyping and testing with real learners. A second objective, though, was for us, for all of us, to learn how to tailor and to improve Design Sprint method, because we took this method um, off the shelf, and we did a little bit of tailoring for course creation, but we, we are not 100% sure that we've done all the possible tailoring. So that's why a second objective for us is to learn how to tailor the method, how to, to make it more suitable for course creators, especially for those course creators working and selling courses as uh, solopreneurs because it's a little bit more difficult for people working alone or in small teams to apply a method which has been designed for working as a team. But we'll see that um, with a little bit of uh, tweaking, we can adjust the method. So just to recap, a design sprint is just a step-by-step -step method for solving big problems and testing new ideas in just four or five days. The initial method was designed for five days, but uh, later on, a lot of uh, sprinters in this community managed to tailor it to make it uh, doable in only four days, which we did actually. In only four days, we've been able to, to test a new course idea. Uh, starting from zero, from just understanding the, the overall challenge, uh, down to uh, collecting uh, feedback from, from real testers, real learners. So the problem is highlighted by this uh, diagram. Usually people are taking this uh, build, launch, uh, and collect data uh, cycle for, for building their courses, for building their businesses, but in reality, the distance between the idea and the launch, this build phase becomes longer and longer just because we want to add more content. We are not sure about the type of uh, learning experience that our learners want. So we have a lot of assumptions. We are building on assumptions. So that's why it takes a lot of time, effort, and sometimes a lot of money just to launch a, a course that nobody will be interested in. We want to shortcut this cycle and to be able to test a course idea immediately with minimum effort, with minimum cost, just to learn if the course would be suitable for our learners' needs. So that's the, the main purpose of a design sprint, is not meant to, to help you develop a full course. Please bear that in mind because Many people are saying, okay, but you've just developed a prototype. Well, validating a prototype, it's uh, probably the most important step in your full development effort. If you are starting the development effort with, uh, with an idea that, that was not validated, you will probably spend a lot of effort in building something that has no, uh, no future on the market. Okay, let's get into the, the actual recap. Uh, we will go through all the steps and we will highlight the outcomes. Uh, first of all, of all uh, Julie Hall has been our decider and customer of this sprint. I've been doing the facilitation part and Chris, Georgian, and Kathy helped the team by developing uh, the actual course prototype. So their contribution uh, in the team was uh, in all phases as course developers or team members. The first part of the workshop, day one and day two, has been dedicated to what we call the ideation process. First, we wanted to understand the challenge and then we wanted to come up with some uh, sketch solutions. Uh, the following two days, day three and day four, have been dedicated to the actual work, building a prototype based on the solution we sketched in day two, and validating this prototype by uh, involving real learners in, uh, in the test process in day four. That's uh, the design sprint anatomy uh, at a glance. 
we are following uh, the double diamond concept. That's the core, the conceptual core of a design sprint, which starts from uh, transforming a generic challenge into a specific challenge uh, through the means of two major steps, discover the challenge and then define the specific one. After we have a specific challenge defined, we can start developing uh, solutions and prototypes uh, so we can actually deliver in the end uh, a tested or a validated prototype, which is the specific solution. So please keep in mind this double diamond concept because it's the backbone of a design sprint. A few important roles, decider, like I was highlighting during the sprint, is the official decision maker for the topic. So we cannot decide as a team. It's not consensus based, it's not a democracy. Decider as a business owner, as an investor, if you will, in this uh, effort has the ultimate uh, power of authority uh, for everything related to the sprints. We also brought in experts and we are bringing in experts in each and every sprint. Uh, in many cases, uh, expert and decider could be the same person, especially in case of uh, education entrepreneurs working alone or working in very small teams. Another role is facilitator, someone who is making sure the process is being followed, uh, keeping uh, the time for all exercises, facilitating the teamwork and stuff like that. This is the part that uh, I've been playing uh, for this design sprint. <clears throat> Excuse me. Just to uh, remind you that design sprint is based, is built upon four major principles. Together alone means that we are working independently, as you've probably noticed uh, across the, the four days but towards the, the same goal. We have a, a common goal, but we are working independently and we are sharing individual work later on. Tangible discussion means that we are not opening endless discussions without having something to show, something tangible, like a sketch or a prototype or a concept, something that makes a discussion tangible rather than, you know, just, uh, just, uh, wasting time. Getting started is more important than being right, which means that we want to move fast because this is more important than second guessing or trying to be perfect. We are not aiming at perfection, we are talking about prototyping, which is in many cases, in most cases, is actually a fake of a final product, is not the full product. So we shouldn't invest too much effort and time in trying to make it perfect. That's the essence of uh, this principle. The fourth one, don't rely on creativity, might be confusing for some people. It doesn't mean that we want to dismiss or disregard creativity coming from people, but instead of relying on someone being the, the creative hero of the team, we are relying on the process that will help all team members to bring in their creativity. So it's a team effort. It's one of the core principles of Design Sprint. Don't rely on someone who knows everything, someone who always uh, has the solution, the right solution for everything. We are trying to, to model and implement a process rather than uh, relying on, on heroes. Uh, conceptually, Design Sprint can be thought of in three major stages. The first one is to understand the challenge, to understand the, the questions that we need to answer in the form of uh, can we questions. If you remember, they are also called sprint questions. Understanding these questions will lead us to um, the possibility to develop a storyboard. The storyboard is a description of what needs to be a prototype. It's a detailed description of, uh, of the prototype to be developed. And then uh, validation as the last part uh, is meant to, to actually answer the initial questions, the sprint questions. So that's the design sprint in a single diagram. The whole point is to validate the idea with the simplest prototype possible. We don't want to invest weeks or months of work in a prototype. We want to be able to, to do it in a few hours because 
we've actually worked for about seven hours for building the whole prototype. I guess it's better to invest seven hours in developing a prototype along with the other three days rather than investing, I don't know, maybe four months of work into building something which is not validated by the market. We are not building an MVP. Some of you might be familiar with the concept of uh, minimum viable product, which is a very powerful concept. It's part of the Lean Startup uh, method. Yet again, a very powerful method, but this method it's, is missing the how to build the MVP. So instead of uh, jumping to, to building an MVP for the complete product, we are starting with something very small, which is the prototype. So actually, there is no contradiction between the MVP concept or the Lean Startup method and the design sprint. They are complementing each other very well. I'm, I'm saying that especially for people who are familiar with uh, this very popular method of uh, building an MVP, a minimum viable product. So let's recap. Day one was about defining the challenge and sketching some solutions that will help us to, to tackle the challenge uh, through the means of a few exercises. First one, expert interview. We tried to get as much learning as we could from the expert and we wrote down some statements in the form of questions. If you remember, those questions are starting with how might we, the so-called how might we's. That's the, the main gain of this uh, or outcome of this expert interview exercise. The second one was to set a long-term goal or a two-year goal along with sprint questions. Sprint questions are different than previous questions than how might we questions in the sense that sprint questions need to be kind of pessimistic. Uh, look at this second exercise, setting a goal. Whenever we set a goal, we need to be optimistic. We look into the future and usually people are aiming for, for doing, for achieving something optimistic. But in the same time, we need to look at the obstacles, obstacles and barriers everything that might prevent us to achieve that goal. These are the sprint questions or can we questions. The last uh, exercise in this, uh, in this series is called map and target. We try to put all our questions on a map in order to identify a focus area. So rather than fixing something, we just wanted to, to map the problems. That's the purpose of, uh, of the third exercise. Let's take a look of uh, the outcomes for these three exercises. As you can see, we collected a lot of how might we questions. I would say this exercise was really successful in terms of the number of questions we've been able to collect. I think there are around 60 or even over 60 questions, which is a very good result, especially because we've been a very small team working on this uh, sprint. So I'm very happy with the results we, we got for this exercise, as well as for the next part, the two-year goal and the sprint questions. We've been able to, to formulate a pretty ambitious goal along with some very realistic sprint questions. Uh, these are the, the, the goal and the questions that have been selected once again by the decider. That's why you see those uh, green or greenish dots on, on them. That's the, the mark of the decision. They have been picked or decided by the decider. The third part of, uh, of this series of exercise was to create that map and to put a target uh, by the means of uh, highlighting the, the focus area. So we wanted to have a focus area. What, what should we focus on in this sprint? So we simply try to, to position all the how might we questions on a very simple visual way to describe a learning journey. This, uh, this learning journey or a pattern for a learning journey is described by three major phases, discover, learn, and apply. Of course, there are more sophisticated learning models and instructional design theories or methods, but for the purpose of this, 
workshop. We wanted something really simple, really actionable in just a few hours. Eventually, we managed to concentrate uh, the, the, the questions in such a way that uh, obviously we, uh, we came up with this focus area, which you can notice is kind of centered on the learning part, which uh, actually uh, helped us to, to drive the rest of the workshop. Once we had this focus area, we, we knew exactly what we want to, to do, what we need to do and to achieve in the remaining exercises. The purpose is not to create a perfect map or a perfect representation for the problem we are uh, addressing. It's more about finding a rough target for the prototype. <clears throat> Please keep that in mind because uh, from my experience, most of the people who are feeling kind of uncomfortable with this method is just because they expect to, to come up with accurate results with fully developed products or prototypes. This is not the case. We are working with the bare minimum uh, as a concept in this design sprint. We just want to invest minimum effort for testing an idea. So that's why all the exercises are emphasizing on this um, minimum, if you will. The second part of uh, the first day was about producing or sketching solutions, which is done in two parts. First, we had lightning demos. We collected some inspiration from a variety of sources, mostly from the internet, in terms of what other people do in regards to our topic, what other, um, let's say, articles we can find or other possibilities to answer the questions of this sprint. This exercise is usually optional, but it proved to be very useful in our case. Although, although I, I've been a little bit reluctant in, in investing too much time, I'm happy that we did it because we, collect, uh, we collected a lot of useful inspiration. The learning journey or the map for this learning journey has been developed, like I said before, with three major stages, discover, learn, and apply. And we have three main actors in this journey. It's first and foremost the learner, but there is also the contribution of the learning management system as a platform for delivering the learning experience along with the instructor because there is no 100% automation in learning. Learning is a human experience and regardless of the amount of technology we use, we still need to keep it a human experience. So we need the human touch, we need the contribution of an instructor. So basically that's our uh, framework to describe both the problem and also the solutions to, to this problem. Uh, eventually, we, um, we came up with four sketches, four models that have been proposed by all team members. And you can see that uh, most of them are pretty well developed. So they are not just bare bones models, like uh, two or three uh, sticky notes or boxes. They are quite uh, well developed which for me means that we manage to apply the principles of the method. It's not really important to evaluate or to judge each concept or each solution individually, but the main outcome is that we've been able to, to follow the process and the process led us to having four candidate solutions to, to choose from. This is a good result, I would say. Uh, that concludes the first day, and we are moving to the second one, which is dedicated to the decision process and also to storyboarding. Decision uh, making process is quite straightforward. It's made of uh, two major steps in, in theory. I mean, the team members are voting on all the proposed concepts, but voting is not used to actually make a decision. It's used just to inform the decision of the customer, of, of the decider. 
So please bear in mind, whenever we say voting in design sprint, it doesn't mean the group is deciding as a group by voting, by applying majority or consensus or whatever. No, we are just voting in order to inform the decider. So we are just expressing our opinions as consultants, if you, if you will, but the final decision rests with the decider. So in our case, um, Julie, our decider, uh, has picked this model, which uh, has been initially called by Georgian from Nada to Tada, I guess. But um, eventually, we took something else from another model developed by Chris, and we changed the name from Zero to Social Media Hero. So once again, uh, this is a very good example when the decider picks one of the models, but also some other ideas from uh, the other uh, models that have not been uh, selected, let's say. A second uh, thing, a second idea, particular idea that Julie uh, has picked was related to the discover part in uh, the model developed by Chris. So yet again, Julie selected the model developed by Georgian, but she wanted to have some ideas from the model developed by Chris. Yet another way to, to combine creative imagination or uh, to combine collective imagination or group creativity into a more coherent solution. Well, once we decided or decider decided on the, on the concept to model, we started the storyboarding process, which is uh, done in two steps. The first one is to identify a minimum set of touch points between our course, our um, learning experience, and the tester. That's why we call it user test flow. These six steps are actually touch points between our course and the learner. We wanted to have something simple because we wanted to be able to develop everything in, in only one day. So that's why we limited everything to only six steps. The steps are on the slide. I'm not going to read them but they are describing fully the journey uh, represented by, by the th three major stages like discovery, learn, and apply. So we follow the same concept, but we just broken down three major stages into six steps. It's a process of decomposition, if you will. <coughs> Excuse me. The storyboard, which is the next exercise, is the part when we actually put some meat on the concept that has been selected. As you can see, we have used a lot of visuals, text, um, arrows, boxes, everything that we can to describe the learning experience in each and every of the six touch points. Uh, I particularly like the way Chris described uh, his part of the storyboard. I do like hand drawing, although I'm not good at it. Uh, in the normal uh, settings, when the design sprint is not done online or virtually, this is the way people are describing their storyboards without using any software tool. They are simply drawing on a piece of paper or on a, on a whiteboard. So please bear in mind the purpose of the storyboard is to serve as a blueprint for developing the prototype. The more details we can put in it, the better is the chance to come up with a functional prototype, with something which is testable. Speaking about prototype, that was the purpose of uh, the third day. Uh, I guess you've been kind of connected with the team for all day long, so you've seen what we, we've done. Basically, we just implemented this storyboard. So it's not something to show apart from the prototype itself, You've seen the prototype. I don't believe it's worth investing more time in reviewing the same prototype. Uh, I believe it's more important to focus on the results of testing because this is where the whole community, I guess, but Julie in particular, is collecting the most value of this design sprint. It's the conclusion and probably 
the real uh, the real value of the design sprint. Everything we've done so far in the first three days is just uh, a way to build up this result. Result uh, represented by uh, all the feedback we collected from five interviews. We had five real learners, five people that we have interviewed. They played around with the prototype. We collected all the feedback. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to broadcast, uh, to share all the five interviews, given some restrictions. Not everyone is uh, ready to, uh, to be put in front of a big audience. Unfortunately, we had to, to respect that and to ensure kind of privacy for uh, our testers, for our interviewees. Excuse me, but I think we've been lucky enough to, to have one of the testers, Marcus, who kindly agreed to, to share everything in front of the audience. Once again, Marcus, if you're in the audience now, thank you a lot for making this experience way more valuable for all of us, but uh, especially for people in the audience. This is what we collected as feedback. As you can see, there are two types, two colors of sticky notes. The green ones are definitely positives uh, for, for, for feedback, for uh, the purpose of testing. So it's something that we, we can rely on as uh, being drivers for developing the, the full product. Whereas those that are kind of orange, although the color is not really orange, are things that need to be improved. Uh, on a first glance, you might say, wait a minute, there are way more oranges than greens on this diagram. Yes, but some of them are just really quick fixes. They are not really uh, big um, effort consuming <clears throat> topics to, to address. Not to mention that uh, many of these individual feedback statements are overlapping. So if we curate this collection of, uh, of statements, we might probably reduce the number of orange down to 70% of, of the number that you see now on the screen. So you shouldn't uh, react like we have too many oranges, the design sprint or the prototype has failed. It's not like this. The way to interpret and use the feedback in a business decision is a little bit more, I wouldn't say complicated, but a little bit more subtle. So the next steps for the decider would be to review the aggregated test findings, the diagram that I showed you previously, and prioritize all these findings uh, by using a so-called impact slash effort scale, which is kind of very simple, probably the simplest tool that you can use for prioritization. I'm going to show it to you in a second. The, the third step would be to actually plan a project for designing and developing the course based on this prioritization done with impact effort scale. The impact effort scale is something uh, very simple. On the horizontal axis, you have the effort required to implement um, some of the suggestions or um, to fix some of the uh, errors, if you want, or uh, flaws in the prototype. And the vertical axis is the impact, impact uh, on, on the learner. Obviously, we want to be able to do very uh, quickly all the small fixes which are re requiring just little effort, but they have a high impact on the learner. These are called quick fixes, and we should be able to, to do it, um, to fix them very quickly. Because usually with 20% of the effort, we can uh, get like 80% of, of the outcome. The second category is high effort and high impact um, fixes. For those fixes or those problems, we need to plan a project. 
Why planning a project? Because it requires more effort. Whenever it comes about investing effort, we need to apply some sort of planning and perhaps a little bit of project management or work management if we want to be successful in investing that effort. For small fixes which are having impact, we can do them on the fly. But for larger efforts, we need to plan a project. Just as a, as a side comment, my other job as a project management consultant taught me in about 20 years that if you plan a project, you have a much better uh, chance of success, regardless of the topic addressed by the project. So please keep it um, as, a, as a key learning, if you wish, uh, which is not necessarily related to Design Sprint. Design Sprint is not about planning projects or managing projects, it's about ideation. But once you have a result, out of a design sprint, the journey of a project is just about to start and you need to apply some sort of uh, project management or planning at least in order to, to be successful. If you have some uh, low effort but also low impact topics in the feedback, you might want to create a backlog and revisit that backlog whenever you have the chance to invest some effort. Uh, why they are not quick fixes? Because they don't have big impact. They are still small effort or low effort to invest in, but they won't bring you um, enough value. So that's why just park them for a while into a so-called product backlog. Whenever you have a little bit of extra time or extra capacity, you can pull one of them in from the backlog and make it as a quick fix. The part that you don't want to address for now is high effort and low impact. You don't want to invest a lot of effort in creating low impact outcomes to the learner. So once again, just to recap, this matrix or uh, impact effort scale will help you prioritize the feedback collected in the fourth day of the sprint. It's just one of the possible ways or methods to be used for prioritization. Uh, I'm just suggesting Julie as, as a customer for this sprint to, to consider this method for uh, reviewing, analyzing and prioritizing uh, all the feedback statements. Okay, sorry. Uh, now I've just finished the, the recap of the workshop itself and I believe I still have a little bit of time left to, to dig into what I call the workshop retrospective. Uh, like I said in the beginning of this presentation and in the beginning of the workshop itself, a second objective was for us to learn how to make it more suitable for course creators. And we learned a lot and we are very grateful to all the team members, but also to the members of the audience who uh, sent us a lot of questions, very relevant, who gave us uh, their feedback. So they created for us an opportunity to learn how to make Design Sprint better, especially for education entrepreneurs or solopreneurs. A few findings about this uh, workshop and the way it has been conducted. I could say that all exercises has, have produced the expected outcomes, which basically means we have been able as a team to follow the method, to apply the method completely. I believe this is a, a very positive outcome. Basically, it says the method works. The team worked very well, although we didn't have a prior uh, working experience together. So we had to learn to work together in a matter of minutes, uh, which we did very well, I would say. The timing was quite good, especially because you probably remember all these exercises are time boxed and sometimes we have just a couple of minutes to finish something or to, to do a voting session or to come up with a statement uh, describing, I don't know, the goal or the sprint question. So I believe we, we've, we've done a fairly decent job in keeping the time and working together as a team. We also noticed uh, there is a huge interest for this topic amongst the course creators uh, 
that uh, have been on the call on the on the webinar which is definitely something very positive personally i consider that as a positive but in the same time we have to acknowledge that the way we designed this experience didn't provide enough engagement opportunities for the audience i think this is something that definitely needs to be improved because like i mentioned in the very beginning it's first and foremost a learning opportunity for everyone. So if we keep this principle, we need to tweak a little bit the way we engage the audience in order to help them to learn and apply everything about design sprints. So that's one of the, the parts of the workshop that we need to, to work on to, to make it better. Another finding which I consider to be uh, particularly valuable is that Liftar LMS as a product can be very successfully uh, used for prototyping, not only for developing full products. We know Lifter LMS can support a full learning experience. We knew that even without the workshop, without the design sprint, but we didn't know that we can use Lifter LMS for prototyping. And I believe most of the features that we have been using in the prototype could, uh, could be found in the, in the free version. I think this is very important because it highlights the benefit of prototyping by investing as little as possible. We don't need other tools. We only need the same tool that we'll be using in the future for delivering the full product. This is really important as course creators. I guess you don't want to... Uh, spend your money in, in buying like three, four, five, or 10 tools just to be able to do prototyping and then to do full development. You can use the same platform, the same product to do everything, prototyping and then full development. So for me, it's a very good, um, very valuable finding this one. I'm, I'm just curious uh, if, uh, you, Chris, might have some thoughts on that because my feeling is that most of the features we have been using in the prototype are available in, in the free version. So people could actually prototype at no cost. Yeah, uh, just to put some color on that, when you said that, it made me smile. I'd never really thought about it that way, but I kind of came at it from a different angle, which is that um, our heart, it goes out to like the bootstrapping entrepreneur who's trying to validate with as little resources and, and exactly as possible and to, to get to not only provide a tool where you can validate for free on the WordPress website you already have for your business and exactly. then continue on with it later. It's very low friction in that sense. So it's, uh, that just makes me smile and proud that it works in this way for the prototyping context. You have all the reasons to be happy and proud about uh, Lifter LMS. <laughs> okay, um, another finding, uh, I guess that would be on my part as a facilitator, is that we had some, we countered some technical glitches, especially with Mural Platform. We didn't have uh, a backup plan prepared in advance, so we had to pivot to adjust on the fly. One way or another, we managed to, to do our last part of the job without using Mural. Basically, we took all the notes offline and then we, we put everything, we uploaded everything into a coherent uh, Mural board. But uh, probably for the future, we should keep in mind preparing some sort of a backup plan for any uh, any tool that uh, we are using. These are very high level findings. Of course, we could get into details and we could refine them or break them down into smaller pieces so we can actually fix them. Uh, now, I'm talking about not findings, but things that needs to be improved. Things that are not uh, necessarily positives. So I try to formulate these opportunities for improvement as how might we questions just to keep the, uh, to preserve the tradition that we followed in this, uh, in this uh, design sprint. So the first one would be how might we increase audience engagement? For me personally, this is a major concern unless we are making it a bit more engaging for everyone. 
I feel like we are under delivering or we are delivering less value than we could possibly do. So my focus is especially on increasing the, the audience uh, engagement. I'm talking about uh, other sessions, of course. I cannot fix something that uh, has done in the past. Uh, the second question is how might we improve the prototype quality? I'm not saying we didn't get a good enough prototype, but uh, we can definitely improve the way we, we, uh, we build the prototype. Uh, it's a matter of um, narrowing down the overall challenge down to specific uh, topics that can be prototyped easily. But it's also a matter of using the proper tools of tracking progress uh, amongst the, the team members. So probably we could do uh, some tweaking here just to be able to come up with a better prototype in terms of quality. Quality overall, I'm not talking about a particular quality metric, but it's something that we can definitely improve in the future. The third question is how might we help people in the community to actually apply Design Sprint? Because that was a learning opportunity, but only five of us have been involved in applying actually the Design Sprint with Julie as main customer. But my question or a question that uh, is drawing my attention is how might we actually help more people to apply, not just to learn, but to apply design sprint in their businesses, in their uh, educational startups. And I'm going to address uh, these three questions one by one. First, for increasing uh, the audience engagement, I'm thinking about uh, delivering some sort of training sessions before the actual sprint. This will help people to focus on the work being done rather than trying to learn and to uh, watch the team as they are doing the job. So I believe delivering a training beforehand would actually give them a better chance to, to get engaged with, uh, with the work being done by the team. The second would be to create an environment for uh, simulating all the workshop exercises like preparing workbooks or having some sort of a sandbox environment in mural, we can come up with multiple ideas. But this is something that we, we want to focus on, creating a way for the audience to at least simulate the work being done in the sprint. It's one of my, uh, let's say, personal concerns. The third one would be to introduce a little bit of gamification in this whole experience. I guess not only for the audience, but also for us as um, team members, let's say. Uh, if we can make it uh, a little bit more uh, dynamic, more engaging through the means of gamification, I think that would be, um, that would be a gain for everyone. The last but not least, uh, probably we need to allocate more time for Q&A sessions. We need to, to, to give people a better chance to ask their questions while the workshop is being conducted rather than waiting until the end. Probably we can fix that. Uh, most likely we can tweak the process and the timing in such a manner that everyone will have the opportunity uh, to ask questions and we will have time to, to actually answer them. So these are a few points, a few ideas that I would like to explore in the future for the first uh, opportunity for improvement, for increasing uh, the audience engagement. The second one relates to the prototype quality. And like I said before, the first thing that I would like to focus on is narrowing down the concept and the storyboard. Instead of trying to do something very big, something very broad, we should narrow down our focus in order to deliver a higher uh, proto uh, quality for the prototype. It's better to focus on, on, on less scope and to, to get a better quality than trying to include everything and not having enough time to, to do all the prototyping work. The second part would be to include visual design uh, in the scope of the prototype. We didn't address that. We just did a few bits and pieces in regards to the visual 
uh, design, but we definitely need to invest more because one of the things that I noticed in the feedback statements collected from all the interviews is that people are really uh, affected or impacted by the visual appearance of the learning product, which is kind of normal. Uh, in all e-learning models that you'll see on the market, you'll see that, that the visual is playing an important role for helping the learner to absorb the, lear the learning and to, to actually get engaged with the learning journey. So that's an important part that I would like to, to spend a little bit uh, more time on. The third way to improve the prototype quality would be to do a better job in prioritizing tasks for the prototype development. Prototype, pr uh, prioritizing tasks and deliverables before actually starting to do the work. This is something that uh, relates mostly with my project management job rather than sprint facilitator. Uh, so probably I will take a closer look on this uh, particular part of the workshop in the future sessions. The fourth point here, or fourth idea for improving the prototype quality, would be to do a bit better progress tracking and time management for the prototyping work. It's kind of difficult because we all work remotely, we are doing various tasks and we are producing different deliverables, so it's a little bit difficult to integrate everything on such a short uh, time frame. Like, I believe we had first uh, a checkpoint after two hours, then each one hour or something like that. We need to do a little bit better time management for the work we are doing as a team in, in prototyping. Uh, the last questions or the last opportunity for improvement is how might we help people in the community to apply design sprint? That's actually some sort of, a, of an overarching umbrella for everything that we are trying to deliver uh, with this uh, design sprint initiative. I'm thinking about more educational content because if people learn how to do it, there is a better chance they will actually do it in their business. The second topic that I would consider, actually I am considering it, for providing more help to, to the community is to uh, help them create or form their own design sprint teams. This is not an easy topic, especially because most of the people in our audience are working alone or in very small teams like one, two, three people maybe. And for them it's quite difficult to assemble a team of at least five people. Actually the, the preferred number of, um, the, size, the preferred size of a design sprint team is around six people. So we've been understaffed a little bit in this design sprint. But uh, helping uh, people to, to form their own teams is uh, something that uh, I want to focus on and uh, I'm pretty sure we'll be able to come up with some ideas. Coaching sessions is probably something that we need to consider in the future for everyone who is interested in uh, ac the actual application of design sprint, not only learning. By coaching, I don't just mean talking about a, a topic. This is lecturing and not coaching. For me, coaching is to help people find their own resources, their own commitment to apply whatever they have learned. So coaching, it's more about enabling people to do what they have learned through any learning experience. It's more connected to the apply part of that journey in three, in three stages. But I guess coaching would, uh, would help. Uh, last but not least, I'm thinking about uh, using or introducing to the community other similar workshopping techniques like uh, LDJ or Lightning Decision Jam, uh, strategy or marketing sprints, 10 for 10, action boards, challenge hunters. All these are just another uh, set of uh, workshopping techniques used for ideation. So if people will be interested in learning other tools or similar tools with Design Sprint, I'm happy to consider sharing uh, my experience with, with this uh, 
with these workshop formats as well. Uh, most of these uh, other workshopping techniques that I'm talking about are smaller in effort and time than the full design sprints. You can think of them as just uh, Lego pieces that you can use to develop whatever uh, testing or prototyping device you want to, to develop. So whenever you have some challenges in your business, you can pick and choose the workshop type that is most suitable for your particular challenge. Design Sprint is not a silver bullet for everything. It's a very useful tool, but there are some other useful tools as well. And some of them are a bit smaller in terms of uh, time and effort uh, to invest. Other improvements, uh, I would say generic improvements, um, is to use better tools for storyboarding, like Sketch, for instance, or many other available tools, just to improve the quality of the storyboard, because the storyboard, once again, is the blueprint for the prototype. Uh, the second idea would be to have some backup options for both Zoom and Mural, because both of them are cloud solutions, and every once in a while, like with any other uh, cloud solutions, they, uh, they run into trouble. So we need to be prepared to have some alternate uh, solutions. There are a lot of, of uh, uh, let's say, alternate solutions for Zoom and for Mural as well. The third idea would be to extend the method with a follow-up plan. The method doesn't prescribe what to do when the design sprint is over. We are just providing some sort of recommendation to Julie as a, as a customer, but there is no prescribed way for her to follow in using the outcome of, uh, of the design sprint. Why? Because that would be part of the project management, like I said before, or the product development. But I'm very curious in exploring ways to extend the actual design sprint with some follow-up uh, work, with some follow-up plan for actually using the result of the design sprint in the business. Uh, another idea would be to identify some sort of patterns uh, of challenges uh, faced by the course creators. Uh, if we are able to identify these patterns, we will definitely be able to come up with customized solutions. I think that was one of the themes that we addressed in our prototype as well. So the idea, the concept of um, tailoring or customizing um, let's say standard approaches, I think it's quite uh, useful for the design sprint as well. We can definitely improve the templates that we have uh, used in the workshop. I'm talking about the mural templates. They can be made uh, more appealing and also more functional. Mural is quite, uh, quite generous in terms of uh, features, so we can improve the templates as well. And another point, which is for me personally is quite important, is to make a better use of instructional design and learning models when we are sketching the solutions. We shouldn't forget that we are all course creators. So regardless of the workshopping method that we use for validating our ideas, we should keep in mind always various instructional design uh, and learning models, because that's the core of our job, of our profession. <clears throat> That's something that uh, I can relate with. Probably I could uh, have thought of uh, using more or a more sophisticated instructional design and learning model. I think it's good that we started with the simplest possible, but over time we need to improve. We need to put a little bit more weight on the instructional design or the learning experience design. Next steps, because I'm figuring out, I'm trying to, to think of the next steps, we definitely want to continue. For me, it was an amazing experience. I, I gained a lot of learning. It was quite fun as well. So it's something that I personally would like to continue to do. Uh, I'm thinking that next sessions uh, should consider all identified opportunities for improvement. We should consider all of them, prioritize them, perhaps using the same impact effort scale, 
and try to come up in the next edition of the course design sprint with an improved experience. The third one would be to establish and nurture, if you will, a course design sprint community of practice or a COP in short. I do have some experience in uh, building communities of practice in other areas, in project management and process improvement. And I'm happy to, to share my, my experience in doing this kind of things with our course creator, uh, course creators community. As a matter of fact, I'm taking it very seriously and I'm ready to invest effort and time in building this community for people who, who wanna get more involved in that and people who want to, to learn more and to apply more of Design Sprint in, in their businesses. As a matter of fact, if you don't mind, Chris, I could also share a link where people can sign up when, if, if they are interested in this community of practice and whenever uh, this community will be ready, we can simply notify them uh, to, to get in touch with us if they want to participate. Sure, sounds great. Thank you. So this is the link. I'm going to share it in the chat as well. It's just a simple um, sign up on a waiting list. So don't expect anything fancy. It's just to show your interest if you would like to be part of such a community of practice. Uh, we are not offering anything now. We are not selling anything. It's just to register your interest for developing this practice of design sprint for course creators. Well, I guess that concludes pretty much my presentation for today. I'm a little bit over time with four minutes. Need That's the project a... manager in you. You're good. Yeah. You're good. <laughs> uh, Are we indeed. good to go into questions or did you have any final wrap up thoughts there? Uh, no, uh, but I would be very happy to to learn about your uh, thoughts about the, the whole experience. Yeah, uh, so do a round around the panel of thoughts and, and experience. Um, for me, I was really blown away by the process. And I've seen a lot of people say that in the chat, that the process does the heavy lifting. I mean, I'm a creative person and I like making stuff up, but to have that combined with a process and not doing it alone, like that whole together alone thing is pretty cool. So I was blown away by that. Um, I really liked how quickly it went through. And also I just see myself included guilty as charged. <laughs> we have a lot of assumptions as course creators and to like go to market and get in front of people and be open to like feedback. I think it's so powerful and it's, you know, sometimes it's uncomfortable or whatever, but it's, you get, there's so many, so much learning in it that like, man, the product's going to be so much better and it's going to be so much easier to sell and communicate about when you develop it with actual feedback. Um, so I thought that was super cool because I had never really done, I mean, I've seen a lot of people using um, tools I've made like software, like Lift LMS and whatnot, but to actually see to conduct user tests was uh, really awesome. And one of the interesting things from the user tests that I found really interesting across the board was this whole um, Facebook ad banner blindness thing. <laughs> like everybody was like, they didn't even see it. I had to like tell them to like, all right, now go look at this thing over here. I thought that was super interesting. So that's just a couple of feedback and points. I, I learned a ton though. That's just a few things, but I'll hand it over. Anybody else on the panel like to, Go next. Go ahead, Julie. I, I'll go. I have some observations. Uh, one, Sebastian, I'm, I'm curious about the process, uh, the design sprint. Is that, is that a process you developed? Is that, I mean, it, it, it's like the agile process a bit, but so I'm not, I'm not familiar with the process and I cannot take credit for developing this process, this method. It has been designed by, <clears throat> excuse me, by a gentleman called Jake Knapp, uh, who is working as a, as a product manager uh, with Google. Uh, it has been further refined by other practitioners of uh, design sprint process. 
I only tailored the method a little bit for applying it uh, to, to course creation because that's a particular area. The method itself, it's meant for pretty much any kind of product. So that's the only thing that I've done, a little bit of tailoring. Obviously, I need to do a little bit more tailoring <laughs> to, to fit the purpose of a course uh, creator. So that's my contribution. I cannot uh, <laughs> uh, for claim any credit. I have Say a course service, Sebastian. This is also, also important to, to mention that uh, uh, the method can be used to, to, for designing services. Yes. As a matter of fact, the products, when we say products, uh, we, we should include both goods and services. In my opinion, learning is a service. It's the delivery or facilitation of a, of a journey, of an experience. So it's more of a service rather than a product. We definitely use products to deliver this experience, to deliver this journey like uh, courses, like content, like, uh, I don't know, perhaps tools. But the main thing that we are creating and delivering to our learners is an experience, which is a service. And there is indeed um, a particular uh, flavor of this design sprint for services, um, which mm, worth considers, uh, consideration for future improvements. Okay. <clears throat> that was interesting. I, I was, it was new to me. I've, I've, uh, I've seen the, the user journey and the journey map uh, where you ha you have a persona and you yep. map their journey uh, and you know and some of the agile process, but I had never seen this design sprint, so uh, that was a new process for me. And indeed, it's a kind of an agile process. That's why the name sprint because uh, they borrowed a lot of concepts from the agile development world. The, the most important one is time boxing. That's why they call it a sprint because everything is time boxed. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's a good idea because otherwise design thinking, which is the, the foundation for design sprint, design thinking is a huge area, mm -hmm. very generous with a lot of knowledge that can be applied, but it takes huge time to right. make it work. So it's like, you know, design, uh, design thinking is like math. Math is huge. It's infinite. If you want to apply math, you need a particular method or an algorithm or something that works particularly for your problem. That's the, the main contribution of design sprint, which is originated in design thinking. Okay. Hope that answers your question. If not, <laughs> just let me know. The other question I had was, you mentioned that one of the improvements you might think about was narrowing down the concept. Uh, can you expand on that just a little bit? Narrowing down the concept and... Yeah. Um, that's definitely one of the barriers in, uh, not in learning, but in applying design sprints. We are quite ambitious usually as course creators, we want to create big courses. To, we want to offer everything we know about the topic. And sometimes we are a little bit over ambitious in doing that. And if we are aiming to delivering too much, we might end up delivering too less. Yeah. But let's not forget what is the purpose of the design sprint, just to test the idea. So we should think of the minimum set of features that help us to test the idea, not the full set. We have plenty of time afterwards to develop a full course development plan. But for the purpose of testing, we need to focus on those parts that are most relevant instead of trying to create a fully fledged learning experience. I'm not saying we've done something wrong in our sprint, but we could probably invest a bit more effort in making it better as a prototype if the scope would have been a little bit less. Okay, so what did you think was the key idea? Because there were some of those things that we had identified that I thought really were not addressed in the final product. And I don't know, I think they, but I thought, we kind of really didn't test. 
some yeah, of them. Yeah, we, 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 we haven't been able to test everything that uh, uh, came to our mind as ideas. One particular idea that I, uh, I, I liked a lot is the idea of customizing the learning experience for the learning. I'm, I'm, I'm really passionate about that. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm trying to do in all my uh, teaching experiences, to customize the learning. Learning is not an off-the-shelf product that you buy and use like a, a bar of soap. Learning is a human experience. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to test something as big as customizing the learning experience when you only have a few hours. So perhaps with a bit of uh, narrowing down the concept, we could have been tested a little bit of customization. I'm not uh, saying to test everything in terms of customizing the learning experience. But that's an interesting thought to be considered for the next session. Right. That was one that particularly came to my mind. We really didn't. We really didn't test that, even though we talked about it. Yeah, because we've been kind of over ambitious. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> we wanted to do a lot, which is a good thing. And the key learning here is aim high. That's why we have uh, a two-year goal. Be very optimistic when you set your long-term goals, but focus more on the next step. Right. Okay. It was good. I, I learned a lot doing it. The process really taught me a lot, and I love having, and like you say, it would have been even a little bit better with a few more people because you feed off the other ideas of the other people. Um, I, I really like a team for that reason because each person brings in different ideas. So yeah. I want to thank all of you. So it's a very, very good experience. Awesome. Thank you. Kathy or Georgia, do you want to weigh in on some comments before we turn it over to the audience? Um, well, one thing that I thought was really interesting from the test user interviews was um, their focus on the videos as far as building trust, production, quality, even how they were getting distracted by the different backgrounds of the people who shot the videos, which was really yeah. interesting because, Chris, you have computers in the background, you know, it looks like a professional studio and one of the people had said that she was distracted by that and she'd rather see a blank wall or so yeah. it just it was really interesting their feedback and um it kind of lied that maybe it should be like a green screen or a plain wall behind them to build trust it i felt like those their comments about the videos were really interesting georgian other thoughts georgian Yes, from my side, I will reiterate, uh, I will stress the idea that uh, we should uh, have been uh, concentrated on less uh, to do it better. Uh, it's uh, also something that I'm, I'm doing most of the time. I overcommit myself to uh, do and to deliver things and sometimes I don't have the necessary time to, to do it. And uh, yes, it, it could have been better to to have uh, less to do in the prototype than, than we actually did. Cool. Well, um, we've got about 44 more minutes and uh, I know the audience has some questions. Are we good to transition to that, Sebastian? I'm perfectly okay. And I'm here for as long as you need me to answer all the questions. So from my personal perspective, we can spend even more than 45 minutes. <laughs> all right, we'll see, we'll see what I'm comes. I'm here to answer all the questions I can answer. We have some uh, from earlier in the chat. So I actually want to start with one of Elena's questions from earlier. And she was looking at the design sprint uh, process and the selecting the user tests. And what she identified, because her program is focused on um, single moms starting online businesses from home, when she looks at the actual um, people that follow her and engage in stuff, there's actually quite a bit of um, like married moms. So they're not like perfect fit customers for what she's doing, but they're still there. You know, in marketing, we call that like a different segment or whatever. Yes. <clears throat> so should, but close. Different, but close. Her question was, should, should she, given that there's like who she's building for and who's actually showing up as like not 
it's not that the other people aren't showing up. It's that more people are also showing up in a different profile. Should she run a separate sprint for the married mom versus the um, single mom or do, do just focus on the single mom or like what, how should, how should she think about this idea that she has these two different types, one not as intentional, but is still there. What should she do? I don't claim I have a, a magical recipe for that, but what comes to my mind is that for the second uh, segment, perhaps she could consider running a so-called iteration sprint, which is sort of a zoom in into a particular area of the initial prototype, which gives the possibility to explore more uh, an additional set of features. So perhaps that might be the answer to serve with the same product an extended uh, segment or another segment along with the initial segment. Um, an iteration sprint is, like I said, a zoom in into the initial sprint. It's uh, less effort required. It's about three days because most of the work has been prepared in advance by the first sprint. So perhaps running a second sprint as an iteration sprint might, uh, might help her to, uh, to either create a derivative product or to combine multiple features into a single product addressing two segments. It, that's just something that comes to my mind right now. But I, again, I don't believe there is a single uh, solution to that probably we would need to get into more details to come up with, uh, with something very practical as, as a solution to apply or uh, a process to follow. One, one follow-up comment on that, just to give you an example. Um, like for Lift LMS, we focus a lot on the expert industry and people who have specialties and they want to teach and coach online. But also a lot of like WordPress professional site builders follow us. So there's like two, we have all these different segments. Yes. I just think I just like that, that I understand. I, I resonate with Elena's question of like, how do we focus or should we just do separate sprints? And I think you answered it. I just thought it was cool. Yeah. Um, so uh, Deborah had a comment. It was more of a comment, but I just wondered if you had any comments on top of that, which was you mentioned the human hours. It was seven hours actually of prototyping, but per person, there were four of us actively prototyping. That's 28 hours. So like in theory, if you were going to develop a prototype to the level that we did, it, like by yourself, it would actually be like 28 hours of prototyping, right? Yeah. yeah. So just in terms just of the amount comment. of effort, yes, that's the amount of effort. Yeah. It's eight hours multiplied by, by the number of uh, people in the team. I think that's one of the cool <clears> things <throat> about the team aspect of it is because four days sounds impossible, but part of that is because there's all that simultaneous work going on which yeah. is cool um there was also a question deborah had about the how might we um streamlining it down to from 60 to 13 and then voting and stuff like that can you just describe that part of how that oh happened? you mean for starting from the huge number of how might we questions actually Many of them are just overlapping, are just the same questions phrased differently. And the process of filtering out a, a reasonable amount of questions is just, once again, to be able to identify a focus area. It's not a precise thing. Uh, you shouldn't be very concerned about the number of questions initially collected and the number of questions uh, which uh, eventually uh, make it on, on the map because the purpose of the map is just to have a rough idea where the problem is on that three stages journey. So it's not meant to provide a precise solution just to give you an idea. Okay, so the problem is pretty much centered on the learning. Then I will focus all our team efforts on the learning part. So it's a very uh, rough estimate if you want of the of the focus area. That's cool. Um, Deborah also had another kind of comment slash question just about developing strategic thinking like with tools. Can you just speak to that more? Like you mentioned some frameworks and stuff, but like as a course creator, let's say we're not trained in instructional design or learning theory or whatever. 
how can we be more strategic in our thinking of how we approach building curriculum and, and just strategic thinking in general? Well, instructional design and learning models uh, are both huge areas. I would probably need days, not hours, to, uh, to get properly into the details of these two topics. But strategically speaking, I see the success in uh, any form of uh, education business or education-based business uh, into two, split into two main parts. First is the, the ideation, the quality of ideas, and then is the implementation. If you manage to handle these two things in the proper sequence, you have a much better chance to be successful at the strategic level. If you don't invest enough in the ideation process, which is design sprint or any other methods, you'll end up investing or spending or wasting a lot of time in the implementation phase. So uh, on a very high level, I would say one of the uh, strategic uh, success factors is to be able to focus on both levels, ideation and implementation. My background as a professional is mostly on implementation. I've been doing project management and consulting and training for project managers for about 20 years. Uh, it's been more recent when I actually get, got into this ideation part. And you know why? Because I've been in so many failed projects in 20 years. Yeah. And I've seen so many huge failures. And I'm talking about billions. Yeah. In terms of money spent or wasted. So what was so missing? I, I tried for 20 years to develop and improve the implementation methods. Because that's my core job as a project manager consultant. But then I realized it's like... Maybe I'm investing my efforts into the wrong part because most of the projects of any kind in this world are failing just because they don't have the proper start. And the proper start means a proper idea, a validated idea. So that's why I became interested in the first part in the cycle, the ideation process. So yeah, I, I would consider that as a strategic uh, point if we all manage to focus on both sides of the business, ideation and implementation. Um, Peter asks, how could you apply a design sprint to a single designer everyday design process? So, uh, I think there are two questions, but please correct me if I'm wrong, Peter. Uh, first, you're talking about working uh, alone as a single uh, designer and second you are talking about uh, everyday design process like something that you do on a daily basis is that right is that your question with the two parts okay the first thing as a single designer as a single person you cannot fully apply design sprint as a method it's designed it's meant to be a team method so there is no alone, all by yourself, a full design sprint. You could get some from some of the exercises, like, uh, for instance, interviewing your customers and collect all the problem statements as how might we questions, and then placing all these how might we questions on a map or a, on a framework, the one that uh, fits into your business. But this is all you can do alone. You need a team to run a design sprint. And that's why I said uh, probably 10 minutes ago that I'm very focused on finding the ways to help individual entrepreneurs like you to find um, partners so you can run a fully designed sprint. But honestly, all by yourself, you cannot do a sprint. It's the same as with the Scrum method, for instance, in development you cannot do it all by yourself or it's uh, the same as with any other project management method you need a team 
especially for everything which needs to be time boxed because you need to concentrate significant effort on very short uh, time frames. As for the second part of your question, uh, applying design sprint for the day-to-day -day things that you are doing as a designer, it's not really possible, but you can use other design sprint-like methods. For instance, lightning decision gems. You could use lightning decision gems just to pick and choose the problems that you want to address as a designer or to brainstorm uh, about ideas, the so-called 10 for 10, uh, or challenge hunter, which is also a workshopping method. This, these are the, the things that you can do, let's say on a daily basis, because you cannot run design sprint on a daily basis, but you can use various components of this uh, overarching uh, framework and to include, to embed these components into your day-to-day -day work. That's why I mentioned uh, a couple of other uh, workshopping techniques that can be used for the overall design process. Most of them are shorter and requiring less effort than a full design sprint. So to conclude, you need a team to work with if you, run, if you want to run a full design sprint. Uh, you cannot do a design sprint on a daily basis, but bits and pieces uh, might prove useful in your day-to-day -day work. Hope that That's answered good. your question. Yeah, he says, thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Cosma, Cosma had some comments here mostly, but just to share, um, she had several takeaways. One was that she really got a lot about learning about workshop facilitation by watching you, Sebastian, as a facilitator, like lead the process. Um, and she said the fact that the process is possible, even just seeing it happen is very inspiring and motivating to people and, and gave her the confidence. And then she immediately implemented WordPress and Lifter LMS tricks as she watched uh, me and other panelists prototyping in the process. So I think there's an element when you do this in public where it really inspires people. I, I, I think part of the thing is that like just watching somebody go through a sprint is might just be part of the learning process. Yes, and uh, uh, thank you for this comment, Cosma. As a matter of fact, that was our intent with, with this event. We could have done just the sprint for someone in the community without providing the opportunity of learning for the rest of the community. And we felt that this is not really enough. Uh, I do believe in that saying, help one people uh, at, uh, each day, but it doesn't really work. So we wanted to open this experience to as many people as we could, just to give them sort of, a, of an incentive to invest a little bit more effort in learning the method. Because if you see other people doing it, you become a little bit more confident in doing it on your own, with other uh, partners perhaps, with other colleagues, with other uh, business associates, I don't know, we can find ways to help people form the team for, uh, for, for running the, the sprint. But yes, that was uh, the intention to, to motivate people to invest a bit more effort on, on this area, because otherwise most of the people will focus on developing content, developing features, including as many features as they can in their full products without even knowing what the customer wants. So basically, Design Sprint will help you all to learn what your public wants rather than uh, what you think they want. That's awesome. Um, we got another question from Elena, which she's basically asking her, um, her daughters, her teenage daughters work with her in her business. And the question is essentially, is there a pro con or you could talk about the difference between doing a design sprint with strangers? Like for example, here, not everybody knows everybody or has worked together before. And, or is it like, what if you do it with just like your team that everybody knows everybody and everybody's kind of worked together for a while, whether they're family members or not? Like, is there, is there an advantage or disadvantage to going through this process with strangers? No, I don't 
I don't think there are advantages or disadvantages. It just uh, uh, we just need to to consider that to keep that in mind when we form the team. I believe it's quite possible to to run design sprints with your with the people you know very well, maybe your coworkers, maybe your business associates, or even your family, as long as you are used to work with them. As a matter of fact, Design Sprint as a service is mostly offered in corporations or big companies, and 90% of the Design Sprint team is usually made of people working in the same place for the same business. So I wouldn't see a particular disadvantage in working with people you already know very well. On the other hand, I do feel is a good opportunity to work with strangers, with people you haven't met before, or people who haven't been involved in your business um, uh, before, because it gives you the possibility to bring some fresh minds into the uh, into the challenge that you are trying to, to tackle. So either way, it works, as long as you follow the process. That's great. Um, Deborah's asking for any other like kind of feedback patterns we saw in the user tests that or could be of general use to people. Um, and I'll, I'll just, while you're thinking, I'll lay some I saw there. Um, the, the Facebook banner blindness was interesting. The video quality <laughs> was um, something that people focused on a lot. Um, people, what else? They were... I think really the quality of the video was, uh, was a major area of focus for most of the, uh, of the testers. So people are kind of sensitive to the quality of what they see, the visual appearance. I believe it's, uh, it's a pattern, it's a theme that we yeah. can definitely uh, notice. Other than that, from the top of my mind right now, I couldn't give you a particular uh, theme that I, I noticed. I saw uh, one that I would just put out there, which is um, like when people click through from the Facebook ad and they were on the landing page and then there's call to action button on the landing page, only one person like went up to the menu and looked around at the course library and catalog that we spent so much time designing and building. Uh, so I, I guess what I learned, I already kind of knew this, but it just confirmed it is that landing pages are very important and that user flow like through time, like don't expect them to like hunt around and like find stuff. Like you have to design the flow. That's that was just something I really yeah, kind of got that's actually the entry point in the in the user flow. So you want to focus them on the learning journey rather than giving them too many opportunities for losing their focus. So try to focus them. Your role as an instructor or course creator is to help people throughout the journey. So help them start properly without too much distraction. And that relates with the quality of the visual design as well. In my opinion, a good visual design should help learner focus on the learning rather than, you know, exploring uh, aesthetics. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, there are probably a lot of uh, interesting uh, themes or patterns that we might uncover. That's part of the analysis. Um, in all honesty, I, I strongly encourage Julie to spend some time on uh, reading carefully all these statements because actually that's the part of uh, feedback analysis and prioritization. You might discover, Julie, that perhaps you have only three or four or a handful of major themes that you need to focus on and for solving or addressing those uh, themes you only need a little bit of more effort. I'm talking about those quick fixes in the impact effort scale. For other themes that require more effort but have a big impact as well, you need to uh, think a bit more uh, project management-like and plan a project for developing uh, the product to, to address those, uh, those themes. But for everything you notice that can be fixed in a few days of work, 
just analyze them, group them into common themes like the ones that we just discussed about and do some quick fixes. I had another question for you, Sebastian, uh, related to what you said earlier about an, a prototype is not an MVP. So MVP stands wow. for a minimum viable product. And in yep. the course creation and the membership site world, a lot of um, leaders in the space, myself included, borrow that from the software world of MVP, minimum viable course, minimum viable membership. Let's say we're kind of, we, how, how would you connect the dots from like prototype thinking to deploying an MVP and then ultimately fleshing out a great product? Or well, can, it, can, you, can you work with both those concepts over totally, time? Totally, totally. Yeah. As a matter of fact, this is how I came across Design Sprints because I'm also kind of a supporter of the Lean Startup method of the MVP concept. I came across this concept a few years ago when Eric Ries published his Lean Startup method, his book. Very useful, very full of practical insights but it's a very scientific method. It's based on collecting data, hard numbers, and feeding these numbers into the cycle of generating new ideas. So it's all scientific. Design sprints, on the other hand, is a, is a bit more subjective way to investigate people's needs and wants. It's not really scientific. If you notice, uh, everything we do in a design sprint, it's a little bit subjective. It's just human touch, human inter interaction. It's about perceptions. It's about impressions. But this is learning. Learning is not 100% scientific. So we need to find the balance between using scientific methods like Lean Startup based on hard data and more subjective methods which are based more on, um, on the human touch, if you will, which is design sprint. The best way to integrate the two methods is to use design sprint as a way to go from your idea to the uh, MVP. Before starting to, to develop an MVP, you need to validate a prototype first. Once you have the prototype developed, you are good to go to the uh, MVP phase. But starting to invest effort in an MVP, I told you in the beginning that build part, build MVP gets larger and larger and larger because you are working with unvalidated assumptions. All you have is assumptions in the beginning of Lean Startup Method. You need to test those assumptions without investing effort in development. So that's why Design Sprint can help you validate the idea very quickly in only four days, and then you can move to uh, the full development of, a, <clears throat> of an MVP. If you could, could you um, bring up your slide deck to the screen of that, that quadrant of impact and um, that one? And, and there's just some questions. Um, there's a question about whether it was what we learned on Julie's or maybe a hypothetical or whatever, what would be an example of something that's definitely backlog versus easy win versus project management time versus, <coughs> can you just give examples of the boxes to help lock I, in the I, learning? I will try, but uh, I'm not sure I'll be able to, to find something quite relevant. As a matter of fact, I could give you, oh, can you see my screen? Yeah, and feel free okay. to go hypothetical too if, it's, if that's easier or whatever. So. Okay, uh, as an example of a quick fix first that I would personally do uh, if I was uh, the customer of, of this prototype, I would definitely improve the quality of uh, everything visual. I mean, videos, um, the so-called web design. This is something very easy to fix, even if you use templates. You don't need to be a great web designer or a, a superstar videographer. You just need to do very simple things. This, this theme of visual appearance, I would consider it as a quick fix. Create a backlog. Um, 
I cannot remember something which uh, got my attention as a potential backlog. Um, and for those that don't know the term, could you just describe what the backlog is? It's like a backlog is just a pile of uh, things that you might want to consider doing in the future, but for the time being, you're not investing. Uh, too much effort. Whenever you have a little bit of extra time, you pick something from that backlog, from that pile of uh, things to do, and you do it. But it's not your first priority. Your first priority is to do quick fixes, something that you know how to do and you can do it uh, quite quickly. The second uh, that you should focus on is uh, themes or topics that require more effort but also have big impact and you need to plan a project for addressing them all it's the top part of the of the diagram the the green boxes quick fixes and plan a project this will bring you success in the future uh, the ones that are not requiring too much effort but are not creating much impact either probably want to keep a list of them it's called backlog, but not necessarily uh, something that you will start implementing tomorrow because they don't uh, create uh, too much of an impact. For instance, um, the part with the Facebook ad, I would simply consider it as a backlog item for the time being. You know why? Because it's not, it's not actually part of the core learning process. It's just the way people discover your learning offering. It's just marketing. When I say just marketing, it, I, I, I'm not trying to say it's not important, but marketing is a different area of your business. Perhaps you would like to run a design sprint for marketing only. And in that particular context, the way you design and publish your ads might become really important but for the purpose of this prototype the ad wasn't really the heaviest piece in the game so i would consider it okay i need to do a better job with the way people are discovering my learning opportunity but it's not going to be the first thing i will work on could be an example of a, of a backlog for those of you who are familiar with uh, with Scrum development or any other agile method like DSDM or a third, or whatever, uh, please don't confuse the term product backlog used in agile development with the term backlog that I've used here because two different worlds, two separate uh, set of, uh, of terms. By backlog in this particular context, I mean a list of things that I might possibly do in the future, but they are not my first priority. That's super cool. Were you good or, or move on or no? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, probably I, I couldn't give you too many examples right now. Uh, let's think of something that forget for now. Forget for now. Um, I didn't feel that many people have been really focused on the pricing part. Uh, perhaps I'm, or maybe I'm wrong, I don't know, but based on my recollection, uh, it wasn't a huge theme for, for them, which is a good idea, or I would consider it as an idea for packaging everything related to pricing and marketing in a separate sprint. Yeah. Because it's the way you, you sell your, your product, but first, you need to, to, to learn if you have a product. Then you can think of pricing. You can keep this learning. I mean, people haven't been that interested in pricing or perhaps the pricing that I uh, offered in the prototype is not really uh, well designed. I will keep it, but only for the, for the future. Perhaps package all uh, things related to sales and marketing in a separate sprint, which by the way, it's a common practice in many companies. They are doing uh, the so-called uh, marketing or uh, strategy sprints just for addressing any 
challenge related to the way they market their products. The purpose very, of this, go ahead, small sorry. Comment, a very small comment, Sebastian. Uh, yes, maybe the price is not important uh, in that sprint, but uh, I would say that the pricing model is. Because if you decide on a pricing model, uh, you could, uh, on a different pricing model, you could uh, build the product uh, itself, the course itself differently. Yes, you could consider that. But once again, uh, it, it comes down to what I said before about narrowing down the scope of the prototype. If you want to test too many things in a single prototype, the quality or the, re the fidelity of the prototype is not going to be very high because you're spreading your, your effort across multiple topics. If you pick uh, less, fewer topics to, to be addressed in the prototype, you have a better chance to invest more effort on those uh, ones that you selected and you'll get uh, a higher fidelity prototype. There are multiple uh, ways of building prototypes of multiple types. High fidelity prototype means something which resembles uh, very much with the end product, whereas low fidelity means something that is just a simulation of the final product. If you want to get into a high fidelity prototype, you need to narrow down the scope. That would be my, my take. But indeed, pricing model is important. Pricing model is something that can drive your uh, future efforts, especially in planning a project, because the way you develop your course or your learning experience <clears throat> is very much related to the way you plan to sell it. So there are connections between the two. That's why my suggestion would be to, to include it in a, in a marketing or sales uh, focused sprint. That's awesome. And I, the, I really love Deborah's question here, Sebastian, which is um, if we're connecting the dots between prototyping first to validate and then MVP, the, her question is around going the other way from the prototype. If we go back in time to where we just kind of decided we wanted to, let's say, build an internet business around education, but we're not sure like what the focus on or come up with that first offer? Can we use design sprint thinking pre-prototype phase to like, to kind of just go from the very, very beginning of, I want to build an education company, mm -hmm. but I don't know what my offer is or necessarily what to focus on. Okay. So basically if I'm interpreting correctly or the question is, I don't know yet what is my challenge. Can I use design sprint for just selecting the challenge that I want to address? Yeah. Is that the, the, the That's core? That's basically it, yeah. Yeah. The answer is quite simple, as a matter of fact. Uh, you could use design sprint as a full experience, as a full for this workshop, but you could start smaller with other types of workshops, like uh, the one called LDJ, Lightning Decision Jam. And you could actually use lightning decision gem just to select your challenges and then once you have selected a number of challenges or a single challenge that you want to focus on be it your be it problem related to one of your products then you can run a full sprint to actually address the challenge but you can use ldjs just to select um, to select the the challenge things that you want to, to address to solve. That's great. Could you um, tell us, talk, talk to, Elena has a question basically around um, tester selection. How should we go about or think about tester selection? Like, like and what, are, what are they? They're because they're like, um, should, they, should they be like as close as we can to our ideal customer or well, I mean, how do we think about selecting testers? Well, uh, actually, uh, we didn't address that very much in the, in the teaching part of this event, how to select test users. But that's a great question because uh, you should actually try to recruit 
people who are part of your uh, of your segment of your niche that's why you need to create uh, to have before the sprint the uh, the personas for for your customers once you have that you can start recruiting users uh, which are falling in the in the category that you are targeting uh, what i would suggest is for a real sprint if you, especially if you want it to to be very effective try to recruit unbiased testers people that you don't know people who don't want to help you because sometimes when people want to help you they might end up uh, not helping you that much actually so try to look for very independent objective and unbiased testers this can be done through a variety of means you can uh, publish announcements on your social media channels look guys i'm looking for testers uh, is anyone interested in uh, taking part of this experience you can sometimes even uh, pay uh, people for being your testers it's not uh, an uncommon practice to pay them to because it's a it's it's a job to be done it's work to be done and it's the kind of work that brings value to your business so to a certain extent i believe it's kind of fair to consider paying for your test users uh, i know companies doing that through uh, amazon gift cards or uh, simply giving them free access to their product uh, in our case would be giving them free access to our courses or something like this like this but the process to select users should be very well connected to the process of identifying your potential customers because this is what you want to test your product uh, in the hands of your potential customers so there is no generic uh, one size fits all recipe for selecting user but look into the way you identify your your market your target market and your potential customers try to use the same principles in recruiting your test users that's awesome um cool um well maybe we can do one more question and then kind of wrap up this uh just a question for julie just what are you thinking going forward and um just like your biggest takeaway and what you think you might do next uh i'm not sure i'm following this oh it's, someone did you I, got go ahead. i got a lot of value from oh, it yeah. uh you know i uh i think that i'm gonna look take i really would like sebastian's uh full sheet of our worksheet so i can look through all the stuff and kind of remember the process and and sort of uh solidify the results and and analyze the data and uh you know come up with a next plan from there so That's i intend to uh you know to do some courses so yeah but i thought it was helpful in my uh in my journey toward that and uh yeah so it was a, it was a good first step and I uh, I learned a lot of things. Uh, the by uh, the testing the people was uh, was pretty in, insightful. Like you said, people people didn't observe things that you thought, oh my gosh, how are they missing that? You know, <laughs> right? So when you get real people in there. It's it's interesting um, the things that that they are attracted to and the things that they totally you know. Uh, like I wasn't, I wasn't ex expecting them to be so critical on the videos, you know? Right. So, um, uh, so anyway, it, it was very good, very good learning experience. So, uh, yeah. that's awesome. Well, thank you. thank you for sharing that. And, um, we are coming up just about on time, Sebastian. Uh, well, first go ahead and drop a comment in the chat. Um, just biggest takeaway. You want to see us do another design sprint at Lifter LMS? Just let us know if you what you uh, thought of the experience. And um, Sebastian, where can people before before we kind of sign out here? Like, where can people go?
to find out more about what you're up to at Experimenter Studios. You have that link, maybe post it again about the community. Yeah, I will. And um, Thank you. and then where are you where where are you driving towards as with this mission? Because I really appreciate it. you. You came to me at Lift LMS, and you're, we've been kind of hanging out, networking online, meeting up over the years for almost five years now. About and. Uh, I've, how can the people connect with you and what's your goal or what are you feeling called to do yourself with this uh, area of expertise? Um, I'm going to tell you about my goal, but first I would like to, to tell you about my key takeaway from this whole experience. Yeah. Uh, it's just a, a reinforcement of a, of a concept of a principle that I knew uh, before, which means that uh, teaching starts with learning about your learners. If you want to be a good teacher, if you want to be a good facilitator for a learning journey, you need to invest in learning about your learners, about what they need, about what they want, because these might be two different things. So this, this is my key takeaway. I'm happy that I had the opportunity to learn about this particular community of um, education entrepreneurs. My goal on long term is to try to bring as much value as I can from the corporate world into this community because this is where I have been working for the last 20 years or so, uh, experimenting with a lot of uh, methods, processes, frameworks, models, and so on. And I'm eager to help small companies or even individual entrepreneurs to use at least some of these methods to deliver better experience for their customers, therefore to build their businesses. I'm a, an entrepreneur myself. I've been working for big companies and for public sector, but I'm running my own company for almost 20 years. So I can relate with the struggle. I can relate with, uh, with all the problems uh, that you are facing as solopreneurs. And that's why I want to bring my, let's say, contribution, perhaps not very, not very much to this community in terms of bringing the expertise that is being used by the big guys, by corporations. So this is what I'm planning uh, to do in regards to all my efforts uh, about e-learning particularly related to the design sprint for uh, course creators. I want to build this community. Uh, I'm sure we can build it together as a matter of fact, and I'm pretty sure that uh, Chris, you will also have, uh, you could have a great contribution to this, uh, to this thing. I don't want to do it all by myself, and I don't want to do it for you, if you know what I mean. I want to do it with you, for you. So I couldn't design a community and the content and the, the events, the, the, the journey in this community, if I don't get some feedback from you guys. So please feel free to uh, connect with me and to let me know any ways that I can help you in delivering better learning uh, experiences. And feel free to... To, to ask questions about anything related to instructional design, to uh, e-learning technology, to design sprints, to project management applied to e-learning development. So yeah, let's, uh, let's build some expertise, real professional expertise in, the, in this community. That's awesome. That be my, my goal. We're totally in alignment. Nothing against big corporations or anything, but my mission is to kind of make these, to democratize learning in a digital classroom, which means- I love that concept. <laughs> to take it, uh, I mean, there's people that pay like $30,000 for an LMS system that's not as powerful as Lifter. And the fact that, that's why what you said earlier about, um, you know, being able to prototype essentially for free from the WordPress site you already have. I, 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 that to me is like a big win that uh, just really aligns with our mission. So uh, we're right there with you, Sebastian. I want to thank Julie for your courage to go with us on this wild ride and, uh, and doing it together. Um, it's been a lot of fun. It takes, it takes courage to do that, especially on stage in front of other people. So thank you for being brave there. And uh, 
Sebastian, Georgian, it's great to do it with you. Kathy, like always, over the past six years, I couldn't have done it without you. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up this webinar, unless you have any final words, Sebastian, for the, for the people. Well, I just want to thank everyone for being part of this uh, event, of this experience. I mean, all the team members and also the audience who have been with us for, for, for such a long time, this, this wasn't a usual uh, webinar experience. And I do appreciate a lot their time investment in this thing. And I look forward to, to continue working one way or another with you guys. So it was a great opportunity uh, for me to, to learn about what, you're, what you need. And I'm looking forward. Like I said before, we definitely want to continue that. And uh, we, should, uh, we should prepare better the next uh, edition of uh, Course Design Sprint. That sounds awesome. Well, thank you everybody for coming and uh, thank you to the amazing panel. It's been a great ride um, and I hope everybody has a great rest of your day. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye.